What's going on everyone? Welcome back to my channel and what's well, actually the start of a brand new segment where at the end of each month I'll be ranking all the new releases that I saw from worst to best. So before we begin, let me know which movies you saw in January, which ones you liked the best, which ones you didn't like. Let me know in the comments so we can discuss. And as always, make sure to hit that thumbs up button if you like these videos as it helps me out immensely by getting my channel out there and growing the community. And if you are new here, I hope you consider hitting that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with reviews of new films, older films, hidden gems, and so much more on a near daily basis. Now, I just want to give a little disclaimer as I know I'm a day late to this, but I had some personal matters to deal with during the last week of January and that's when a lot of new releases dropped and the idea will be that I get these out before the end of the month but there were some movies on this list that didn't have formal reviews which I will rectify soon as well as movies during that last week that I just didn't get to see so I'll include those on February's list and then hopefully we'll be back to square one. But I did see 16 movies in January overall, and that was way more than I was expecting to get around to because I only had five movies on my most anticipated of the month list. There were a few unexpected surprises, so let's not waste any more time and let's jump right into it. In last place is Hunted, a Shudder original movie about a woman who meets a guy at a bar only to find out he's a sadistic kidnapper who chases her into the woods along with his partner. This tries to be like one of those schlocky grindhouse horror movies in the vein of I Spit on Your Grave or The Last House on the Left. It'll have moments of uncomfortable violence and severe mental anguish for our main character that's supposed to get flipped around when she begins getting the upper hand on these two. This movie didn't reach the same levels of uncomfortable as the other movies I listed did, but it was still hard to really enjoy this as the dialogue and the acting was, to be honest, borderline atrocious. A lot of the conversations felt like bizarre non sequiturs that didn't totally fit the scenes in which they were said, and the acting felt like something straight out of the room, and I really wish I could say I was exaggerating there but it was bad. I'm not sure if that was done on purpose to give this more of a low budget amateur sort of feel, but it goes on for the entire movie. It's very distracting and it caused me to really not be able to get into it. Next up is Outside the Wire, the first Netflix original movie of the year currently sits as their worst from what I've seen so far. It gives off a lot of Terminator vibes where a soldier has to team up with this android to stop a nuclear attack in the near future, but it was all very surface level stuff. While all the performances were fine, with Anthony Mackie being the one really giving it his all here, and there were some interesting attempts at social commentary, you're following around a pair of incredible incredibly dull characters, and they're out to look for a villain who you don't even see for the first time until over an hour in. So there wasn't much there to grip you emotionally. And as these two set out on this adventure, rather than showing us this potentially fascinating new world, it goes on long expositional tangents that get to the point of boring very quickly. And it causes the movie to be about as robotic as some of the robots we see here. Then we get to HBO Max's Locked Down, one of many attempts at telling a substantive story set in the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all still experiencing. And Hathaway and Chuadel Ejiofor play a married couple with troubles who attempt to rob a jewelry store while still in lockdown. It has a great director in Doug Liman, a charismatic cast who definitely try here, but the film is very bloated, focusing more on the stretched out scenes of characters hanging out on Zoom, which feel like they were placed there more for for the sake of pointless celebrity cameos, with only so many of them really working. And the heist aspect of the film ends up not even playing a big part until about the last 30 minutes or so. I think had they cut out a lot of the Zoom stuff and focused strictly on Hathaway and Edge of Four together, and then maybe bumped up the heist stuff to a little earlier, it would have worked better. So while there were some occasionally funny moments and two nice lead performances, it ends up just being a dud. At number 13 is The Little Things, the first of many films this year getting released both in theaters and on HBO Max for a limited time, and it's really not a great way to kick things off. You have Denzel Washington as a deputy who teams up with a detective played by Rami Malek, 
to catch this serial killer, and it's meant to be this gritty crime drama in the vein of Seven, or really any other 90s thriller. It's supposed to come off as insightful and philosophical, with all these cryptic exchanges of dialogue throughout the film, but it's really not as deep as it thinks it is, and its stylistic elements hide the fact that there wasn't really much there substantially. It had some good performances from Washington, Malick, and even Jared Leto as the main suspect, though while it's somewhat intriguing at times, it ultimately falls short when it gets to its finale that feels totally underwhelming and due to its twist left kind of a bad taste in my mouth to be honest. At number 12 is Don't Tell a Soul, a mix of a thriller with a coming of age drama when two brothers rob a house only to get chased by a security guard who then falls down a forgotten well and gets stuck and they're the only two people who know about it. This could have been really compelling and it had a lot of promise to it. The cast was solid, especially Jack Dylan Grazer as one of the brothers and Rain Wilson as the security guard, but this has two wildly different tones that repeatedly clash throughout the movie. We'll have scenes where a Characters are hitting each other, cursing one another out, and at several points even threatening to kill each other, but then they'll be immediately followed by scenes of these same characters in moments that are supposed to come off as sweet and sentimental, and we're supposed to suddenly think they're misunderstood. And it felt very disjointed. The decisions made by some of these characters didn't feel thought through, and again, it leads to a finale that felt both contrived and totally out of left field. This was the one I found to be the most disappointing on this list. At number 11 is The Dig, Netflix's period drama about an excavation in which a burial ground is dug up on a woman's estate. And this is another movie where the performances are the best thing about it. You have Ray Fiennes as the guy in charge of The Dig, and Carrie Mulligan as the woman whose property this is on. And I thought they were both great, but the story just isn't all that interesting. It tries to play up the importance of this excavation, but it was just hard to feel an emotional attachment to the situation, and I think the importance would have been felt even more had this been a documentary instead of a narrative feature. Now they do try to flesh out the characters by diving a little bit into their personal lives, and some of that worked enough to make this a decent watch, but it only grabbed me so much, though then again I'm also not a fan of these period dramas to begin with. So while I respect the film, it's nothing I'd revisit, but if if you like these movies to begin with, maybe you'll have a much different view of this. At number 10 is The Ultimate Playlist of Noise, a Hulu drama about a music-loving high schooler who has to undergo a life-saving surgery that will also result in the loss of his hearing. So he decides to create one final playlist to leave as his legacy before losing what he loves the most. This is basically your typical young adult drama, and that's going to be for better or for worse. It's a sweet, sentimental movie with some romance thrown in there when our protagonist meets an aspiring musician in his travels, who tags along for the ride. It feels like the young adult version of Sound of Metal, hitting some of those same themes, but going for a more inspirational, melodramatic tone. And I thought it was fine. I enjoyed it for what it was. It's not the most original movie out there, but it hits enough of the right emotional beats, and it certainly means well, and sometimes that's all you need. Number 9 is Shadow in the Cloud, the very first film of 2021, and probably one of the most polarizing movies as a whole on this list. Chloe Grace Moretz plays a World War II pilot who talks her way onto a fighter plane only to discover a sinister force is following her and his crew. This is another movie where it has two distinct tones. The horror-like first half is Chloe Grace Moretz in the turret of this plane by herself in this dialogue-driven extended sequence that could have been something straight out of a stage play. But then it switches gears halfway through into a very over-the-top action movie in the vein of a pulpy B-movie that will repeatedly stretch your suspension of disbelief. And I mean it gets ridiculous. It's a very jarring shift in gears, but at least it doesn't try to go back and forth between the two tones. It sticks with one for the first half and then another for the second half and it stays consistent in each of those halves. It'll still be polarizing, but at least there's a chance that you can get adjusted to the change in pace and then just enjoy it for how ridiculous it is. Number eight is The Marksman. 
Liam Neeson stars as a rancher who has to protect a young boy from a gang of cartel members out to kill him. You'll find that it's similar to every other Taken style action movie Liam Neeson's been in for the last decade or so, and if you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all, so depending on how much you like those films in general, that will be more or less how you feel about this. It plays things pretty safe as far as those movies go, but it's actually kind of fun for what it is. The action scenes are well done, and Liam Neeson's great as always, plus there's a nice chase element that's consistent throughout the movie that keeps the stakes relatively high, as Neeson's trying to always stay one step ahead of these cartel members, and even in the moments where Neeson's just in the car with this kid and they're just getting to know each other, it's actually kind of sweet, without ever veering off into having two conflicting tones. So if you don't mind these movies to begin with, you probably won't mind this either. At number 7 is Baby Done, and from here on out, all these movies I'd wholeheartedly recommend. Rose Matafeo and Matthew Lewis star as an adventure-loving young couple whose lives are upended when she discovers she's pregnant. This is a sweet, very funny romantic comedy that captures the anxieties that come with approaching parenthood. You have Rose Matafeo desperately trying to cram in a bucket list of things to do before this baby arrives, while Matthew Lewis frantically tries to actually prepare for the baby's arrival kind of on his own. It's a somewhat typical clash of conflicting personalities, but I thought the two lead performances were great. I think the way it handled some of its themes about preparing for this life-altering event were very touching, and it provided a lot of nice laughs. This was originally not on my radar whatsoever, but I'm glad I got to see it. At number 6 is The Night, an Iranian psychological horror movie in the vein of The Shining, in which a married couple check into a hotel only to get haunted by a series of frightening visions. While this does bear some similarities to The Shining in its general premise, these go in two totally different directions as far as the details. This goes for a somewhat minimalistic approach, as it's not heavy on dramatic beats, but instead gives us scene after scene of creepy things happening to this family, all while we're trying to cover elements of their past that seem to play into what's happening to them. I thought this was a very effective horror movie. It leans into some more abstract elements at times, but it never gets to the point where things are too vague or you have no clue what's going on. I thought it did a great job of giving us slow burning suspense, but still making it feel like things move quickly for the most part. And I thought it was a nice mix of thrills and compelling character drama. In fifth place is Bloody Hell, an Australian horror comedy about a man who unexpectedly reaches celebrity level status, tries to run away, only to be captured by the sadistic family with plans of their own for him. This channels a lot of the energy of the Evil Dead movies, with an emphasis on practical effects, splatter humor, and wacky over-the-top scenarios, including this one running gag where our lead character speaks to his conscience, which takes on the form of a wisecracking version of himself. The film is a fast-paced, energetic film that throws a lot at us and it sometimes feels like a live action cartoon with its quick edits and exaggerated sound effects, keeping things moving along very nicely. Ben O'Toole, who plays our lead character, was by far the most fun aspect of this film, giving off similar vibes to Bruce Campbell in the Evil Dead movies, and his interactions with his conscience were some of the highlights of the movie for me. If you like silly B-movies, you won't be disappointed here. In fourth place is The Delivered, or Fanny Lied Delivered depending on where you are. Taking place in the 1600s, a woman living a strict Puritan lifestyle with her husband finds her life upended when a mysterious younger couple finds their isolated farm and stays with them. I thought this was going to wind up a lot lower on this list because of the period drama setting, but it's actually more of a thriller than it is this easygoing character drama. It's actually pretty exciting, especially after it hits that first half hour, 45 minutes or so, and that's something that I feel isn't seen all that often in these sort of films, so I was pleasantly surprised by this. The film is supposed to give off this very empowering vibe, as this woman, who's only known life to be this one thing for so long, gets a taste of how there's so much more out there for her when she does meet this couple, who have an interesting bit of backstory to say the least. And it has this nice mix of subtle social commentary balanced with an effective cat and mouse type thriller, and it made for a pretty enjoyable experience. 
In third place from Netflix is The White Tiger, about a young man who lives a life of servitude, only for him to want to rise to the top when he discovers who the family he works for truly is. This received a lot of comparisons to Parasite, and thematically, yeah, they are pretty similar, because they both talk about the class system, and they do so through bits of dark comedy, and it was mostly effective. I don't think this hits quite the same amount of emotional heights that Parasite did, but I still had a really good time with this. I think it got all of its points across well, it's a mostly engaging story outside of maybe being a bit too long, and it doesn't sacrifice telling something emotionally satisfying just for the sake of getting a message across, which is something you often see in a lot of movies that have a message, so I was glad to see how this one turned out. In second place is Psycho Gorman, a film that does not deserve to be as good as that title suggests. But this is about an evil alien overlord trapped in a stone that's found by two little kids who then free him and use him as their pet. It is a totally ridiculous movie, but it is such a fun time. It feels like the natural continuation of movies like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies from the 90s and the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie. All the aliens and weird creatures we encounter in this film are all in costume, and everything is done through practical effects, and it is hilarious. It sounds a bit gimmicky, as a lot of the jokes center around this monstrous creature who can kill everyone in the movie with ease being bound to take part in childish antics by a bratty little girl. But a lot of the jokes land really well and it has a great tone that doesn't ask you to take it seriously whatsoever. It's just some dumb fun, which we can all use right about now. And honestly, with the amount of material they gave us, especially by showing there's so much more to this universe to explore, I'd be totally okay if they were to throw a sequel our way. But in first place is Our Friend, starring Jason Segel as a man who puts his life on hold to move in with his two friends when one of them, played by Dakota Johnson, is diagnosed with terminal cancer. I am normally a little hesitant with movies that centralize an illness, as they can easily be done the wrong way and come off as very manipulative. But... This is not the case, and this works, because it does something interesting where it highlights how this illness is really exacerbating this family's worst qualities, and how they just don't go away because of everything that's going on. So Siegel tries to be the glue that holds everyone together, and he does so in what feels like a heartfelt, authentic matter. It's anchored heavily by its performances, with Siegel and Johnson being the two big standouts, and it has a touching story that will feel all too real for some viewers, but it'll be sure to resonate with you deeply. And that's January, one month of 2021 down, as wild as that is to say. But it surprisingly wasn't the worst January we've had in terms of movies. There was certainly more here that I enjoyed than I was expecting to, and I still have to get through a few more that I missed in that last week, which I'll have for you in February's list. Plus, I'll also have some reviews out for the movies on this list that I didn't get a chance to talk about more in depth, so stay tuned for that and much more coming very soon. Let me know though, which movies did you like in January? Was it anything I listed here? Something I left off? Did you agree with this list at all based on the movies you saw? Let me know in the comments below so we can discuss. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. And for more movie reviews and film discussion, please make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated. Thanks for watching everyone and I'll catch you next time.